today. We celebrate the fifth Sunday of East or of Lent. As we get closer, we're on the home stretch to the celebrating the greatest event in the history of the world. Our Savior going into his passion, suffering, his death, and his resurrection, which we will celebrate in a couple weeks. In this gospel here today brings up a question. Brings up a question that we should be asking ourselves continually. But since this is Lent still, it's a special time of examining who we are in the spiritual life and who we are in relationship to God. So today we can ask ourselves this question, drawing out from something I'm going to tell you in this gospel here. This question of, is there something in my life that prevents me from giving my whole full life over to God? Or is there something I need to let go of? Our gospel story today. This is... After our Lord had raised Lazarus from the dead, he's entered into Jerusalem, which we're going to celebrate liturgically next week, Palm Sunday. So he's entered into Jerusalem. The people are excited. They want to make him the Messiah King. He enters into the temple area, and there's Greek-speaking Jews or God-fearing Jew, uh, Greeks. There's Greeks there from all around the world. They come to Jerusalem to worship for the Passover. So our Lord is there in the temple area where the Greek area is allowed for, the Gentile area, the court of the temple. And these Greek speakers, they've heard about our Lord, obviously, because they want to see Jesus. Those beautiful words. We want to see him. So they go and they approach Philip, who's from an area in the Holy Land that's 50% Jew, 50% Gentile. So they approach him and say, we want to see him. And then Philip, being he's a kind of a subordinate apostle, goes to the elder, Andrew, and says, we've got these Greek speakers They want to see our Lord. So they both go and approach our Lord and say, there are people that want to meet you. Then our Lord goes into this statement here. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, meaning it's now the time for his passion. God the Father is going to glorify him in his suffering and his obedience, which is going to happen at the end of this week. So then he continues. He says, Amen, Amen. And any time our Lord says Amen twice, our ears should perk up. He's trying to tell us something very important. He says, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Then he goes on to say, Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. What is our Lord here trying to teach us? In an obvious sense of what he's saying here is that this is his time, that he must give up his will to the Father for the reason why he's come. He's been sent to the world, and that's to die for our sins. He has to die to himself and what what he desires in order to suffer the passion in his death. So he must die like this grain of wheat, this little grain that falls to the ground. It goes off the spike of wheat. The stalk falls to the ground, enters into the ground, dies, it cracks open, when it's buried, and then it rises as a new plant full of new fruit. This is what's going to happen to him. He's going to die 
He's going to be buried. And then when he rises again, he's going to give this beautiful fruit, the gift of the Holy Spirit to the apostles so they can go out and spread the gospel message to all of the world. So this is the obvious meaning of what he's saying here. But there's a spiritual meaning here too for us in this grain of wheat falling to the ground. Spiritual meaning is this grain of wheat, this little grain, must detach itself from the stalk, enter into the ground, and then rise again spiritually. This is, has meaning for us. So many times, living in the world as we do, and not always thinking of heaven, we have to be detached from this stalk. We too must break off from the world and enter a death to ourselves. And then when we're free from our own disordered appetites, our disordered loves, that we may rise again to produce great fruit, spiritual fruit. This parable, this analogy that our Lord is using, is talking about the spiritual life and in many ways how we need detachment. Just like that grain becomes detached, so we have to be detached from different things of this world so we can think about God as being the primary good in our life and heaven as being the place that we desire most. Detachment. Some spiritual writers um, speak of it differently as in holy indifference. Holy indifference. Meaning not so much that we don't care about things, but that uh, we can take it or we can leave it. That our hearts are not just clinging to things. So what is detachment or holy indifference. It's a process of unbinding the soul, our mind, our wills, and all self-centeredness, and our desires, our hopes, and to seek things that are not God. So we have to be detached. We have to be indifferent in those things. And it's difficult for most of us it's difficult. It's difficult for me. Um, I'll give you an example. And the, the first example of how we need to be detached is primarily through um, our senses. So God has given us our bodies. Our bodies are beautiful. We have senses of sight, smell, taste, touch, all these different things. And God wants us to be happy. God wants us to love life but not think that our paradise is here. So an example here of how this first sense um, appetite can get disordered. So I used to work at a place that had a Chinese restaurant about a mile away. It was a great buffet, and I know sometimes buffets not so great, but this place was fantastic. And I love Chinese food. I mean, I love it a lot, um, which that's not that unusual. Many of you like Chinese food too, but 1.4 billion Chinese people like Chinese food. So it's not that uncommon, but when you like it a lot like I did, I, I would go to the restaurant and being it was a buffet and there was lots of different choices, go in and have a first plate of food. It was just delicious. And then second plate, put some more on there and start to feel full and then I got to have some of those little uh, pot stickers and different things. And before I know it, and then you convince yourself, well, I got to get my money's worth here. So you go back and by the end of uh, dining, just feel like you're going to explode. Um, it's kind of a gross feeling. This is our body saying, uh, you, you overdid it. Well, I, w I would do this uh, a couple times a week. And it became kind of a bad habit. Like I would start to think about the food that, uh, let's say I wasn't going there that day, oh, I just feel that hunger for this food. So I was realizing I had a problem. This is a sin of gluttony. 
Gluttony is a serious sin. So I stopped going for a while just to say, okay, I need a break from this. Um, and then I would go back every once in a while and kind of moderate. Uh, but I, it was always kind of a, a temptation there. So eventually I got a new job that took me to Minnetonka at the Glen where I, I'm a chaplain. And I was kind of happy. At least I wouldn't have this temptation anymore. And then after working there for about a day, I realized out the back door, about 30 feet from my, the back door of the building, which is about 40 feet from my office, is a Chinese restaurant. So I realized that God was still working with me and I needed to cooperate with God's graces to overcome my temperance problem, because that's what it is. It's a temperance problem. But there's other things. So we have senses, um, food. We desire great, rich food, good drink um, for innocent ears here. I'll give a, maybe a euphemism. Uh, sins against the sixth and the ninth commandment or intimate relations between what should be for a man and a woman in the state of marriage. Um, those things can be beautiful, right? But sometimes they get disordered. Other things that we get, un- uh, we get attached to that we need to our souls to be unbound from. Uh, there's other examples like possessions and money. We're such a wealthy country compared to so many areas in the world that we desire, many of us, to get more and more and more and we, we become possessive of it and it becomes a terrible uh, burden in the spiritual life. When we think about money, we think about things, maybe even beautiful things, and money's not bad. It's just that attachment to it or longing for more and more and more. And even the poor, those who are materially poor, can suffer in the same way where they want things that they don't have. And maybe they need things, but they want, and it becomes obsessive. So we need to be detached from that. Uh, Another big thing in our culture is health and beauty. Health and beauty, where we spend billions of dollars on trying to stay alive longer than God really wants us to be. Let's not say we shouldn't take care of our bodies, because our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. But when we just become vain about keeping our bodies in good shape, or um, taking care of our bodies with Uh, prolonging our life, or when especially we can't offer our sufferings, when our bodies, like my age, start to kind of break down, when we're not as healthy as we used to be, to take those sufferings and say, Lord, you're in charge here. I'm trying to do what I can to stay healthy, but eventually I'm going to die, that I can offer these sufferings up for my own salvation the salvation of others. Uh, Another thing, reputation. Reputation. So having a good reputation is a good thing. Out of the sense of justice, the virtue of justice, we should have a good reputation and we should defend it. But sometimes, especially in the age of social media, we get wrapped up on inserting our own opinions to puff up our pride or to argue with other people or to um, always be right, get the last word. And it causes so much anger. It causes so much anger and hatred in our world today, especially through social media. And the last thing that might be surprising is in the spiritual life, that we need to be detached from God. That sounds strange, right? It is strange. It's a paradox here. So I don't know if you've ever experienced, maybe it's at a holy hour. You've gone in front of the Blessed Sacrament, or maybe it's reading Scripture, or maybe it's coming forward to receive Holy Communion, and God is just pouring out his sweetness to you. Maybe you've experienced tears of joy, or um, just this euphoria that comes over us in prayer at times. That is sometimes a very good thing. But other times, when we experience dryness and we don't experience all that um, sweetness in prayer, that we get attached to that sweetness. And sometimes the dryness can be from sin, no doubt. But sometimes God wants to wean us from that sweetness. And then we 
lose the desire to prayer because it's dry sometimes. Maybe after praying over and over, you don't experience any sweetness. God wants us to be detached from that sweetness so that we desire to pray to God and to worship him for his sake alone, not for our own benefit, but just to worship him and thank him, be grateful. So these are some common areas. Many uh, of us have different things too. But I'd like you to consider, take this week before Palm Sunday and just say, Lord, what am I holding on to here? And usually the way we can tell that we're holding on to something is if we lose it, it hurts. If it hurts, it's probably a disordered attachment. Think about those things. What do I hold on to that if I lost it, whether it's a material thing, another person in my life, uh, anything, that if I lost that thing, if it went away suddenly, I would hurt and feel sorrowful. Those are things that we need to get overcome. I'd like to offer this last uh, reflection here on a prayer. This is from St. Ignatius of Loyola, great, great saint in the spiritual life, great writer. He wrote, knowing that we all have these attachments, or a little prayer. It's called the sushipe, meaning take and receive uh, from the first words of this prayer. It's very short. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, in my entire will, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me.